Good evening, Goodman Games fans, and happy Halloween. Welcome to another Halloween episode of Raw. And I am one of your hosts, DJ Foxy. And joined with me, as always, is my co-host. Molan, the Chaos Lord. And Molan, we have an outstanding guest here with us this evening. Uh, would you like to do the introductions? Oh, yes. It is the Master of Mutants. Marvelous Marv! Marv, how are you doing this evening? Marvin the Mage. Uh, I'm here with advice for young cartoonists. Be very careful when you design a D&D cartoon character at age 18 because you may grow into him. All right. Oh. <laughs> well, I hope you brought some treats for us, uh, Marvin the Mage. Uh, or are you full of tricks this evening? <laughs> well, <laughs> rules is written tricks because I'm kind of don't GM like the theme of the show, but I'll do my best to bring the treats well as always thank you for joining us this evening uh it is a pleasure for you being on as a guest we we absolutely love you coming on again thank you very much um our first question from last week and, and we dove right into it because this one mm -hmm. gets talked about a lot as being overpowered and i would love to hear the thought process on how you balance the plus five mutation check that the members <laughs> I watched of the, the Children left. of the Glow Archaic Alignment receive. I want to start with there are no wrong answers and you run your table <laughs> however you want to. I adore Erica and loved all her answers. Um, I just don't feel the need to do triple somersaults like that. You know, uh, that for that uh, plus five check for Children of the Glow, you know, which is, uh, I mean, you'd have to run an evil campaign if the whole party went that way. Uh is is there and it's fine it you know it's okay with me <laughs> is it too I, I, easy at first level marvin i mean uh as rules okay there's rules is written and then there were clear intentions i mean a lot of those uh archaic alignments are uh adversarial and designed to be that way so to have player characters line up for them i where where i loved what erica said is that would be okay. We'd all have to sit down and agree. You're going to go play the bad guys, which is fine, if, if that's what you and your group want to do. And um, uh, now the pain starts. Go spend a week in the um, glow desert and make your saving throw every day, and get constantly attacked by you know crystal and sandworms and everything else, that, screamers and everything else that's out there. And if you survive all that punishment and come through the other end, which you could, I think, you know, good dice rolls, mm -hmm. burn, burn luck. It'd be a great. My answer is like it is to most things. That would be a fantastic character funnel. Somebody right. write it. Why? Why are they the bad guys? Why are? Why is the children of the glow? Why are you looking down negatively on them? They just have <laughs> alternative morality. A chaotic well, one, yes. And, and that's kind of the uh, idea we were coming up with when we approached our second question: How could you simulate the week long trial in a radioactive area to become the children of the glow? So, Jim, let's say you've got a zero level character or Marvin, sorry about that, that just leveled up and you want to simulate, they want to be a children of the glow. How do you simulate that? What what are you, what roles? Are you giving a little uh, little one-on-one -on -one story action here, a little paragraph? What, what's uh, churning in that brain? Well, you could do it two ways. I mean, if, if you and your group have sat down and discussed this and this is the way the campaign's beginning, then the character funnel would just be a, a bunch of... Uh, normally rolled up characters who've decided to peel off from whatever their home tribe was and and go find these guys so they'd have to go find them to join them because you don't just get in by going and getting irradiated you've got to go find them first which would be a fantastic funnel adventure because they're not going to be nice when you find them and then uh, oh my god so much emergent role play then happens yeah i do love the idea of that funnel being created so, uh, so you definitely think it's a funnel adventure. I mean, it could be an upper level, but but you would veer more towards the funnel than something upper level. Well, again, you and your group do it whatever you want, but in the DCC philosophy of things, you know, a lot of us grew up in the era of, D, you know, money hall DMs. You just hit town with your loot from the dungeon and go hit the magic shop. Some of our campaigns work that way. So um, that's not the DCC mindset. The DCC mindset... I can't remember the name of the adventure now. Michael Curtis wrote one that's basically won a magic ring. Well, the whole group piles in and has this giant advent adventure. And at the end, if you're successful, you get a magic ring out of it. That's Making of the ghost ring. It's a good one. 
as, as and um as a gm sometimes you could like if you, it's a newly formed group you can just and con games are separate that one-offs just go have a blast but if if you're taking the temperature of a new group that's a good that's a gm trick because it even happened in the original mutant murder hobos campaign you know about fourth fifth level the player requests start coming in as a, as an actual campaign is forming. Well, I want a mount. How do I get a mount? I want to improve my stats. How do I get my stats? And I, you know, would just answer back. Well, you know, uh, Siegfried, the giant three arm mutant, trains people all the time. Go see him and do what he says to do. You want a mount? You just passed a giant herd of giant grasshoppers. Go go subdue one and see if you can break it. And if the players are into that, they'll just go run off and do those things. If they start to uh, express disinterest, then you know, okay, this isn't going to this isn't going to be that kind of group, and you know, tack your sails accordingly. All right. Well, Milan, I know you can't really see the questions with your monocular vision, uh, so you tell me if you got one ready, and I'll let you oh, read I, it. I got them. We're talking about the okay. chosen zoo. Right. How how beneficial should maneuvering Terry D for a member of the chosen zoo? Oh, well, they should definitely have a leg up because if there's one thing the planet's full of, it's sentient animals. And somewhere in every village is at least going to be a spy for the chosen zoo. Um, mm. So, you know, once you get in, and that that's an example of a uh, uh, archaic alignment that would not rec be a campaign record for player characters to go join. You uh, just have, it would, you know, like everything, there would be pros and cons. You'd join and you'd get access to a lot of, you know, intel from their various military organizations that have reported back in, you know, with com badges maybe even. So it could be good, good stuff from far away. But the pay it meant is going to be, you're going to get orders and, and you're going to be collecting info and giving it back to them. And you would inevitably, there'll be, a uh, conflict of interest somewhere along the line. It's just like when you have a patron, you have to do what your patron wants, whether it's your desire or not. Yeah, we didn't even really talk about that at all, Milan. We no. we we dove into having little caches and stuff like that, and getting routes through Terra AD from the uh, you know the the outposts and and knowledge that the Chosen Zoo have as a collective. But we didn't even get into the part where they're going to get orders and be like, hey. The, your buddy that you've been traveling with for five years, he's getting a little too uh, up in the ranks of this other archaic alignment. We need you to take him mm -hmm. out. Yeah, make sure you get this artifact and, you know, leave it at the dead drop, you know, yeah. instead of taking it back to the village. It reminds me of uh, secret missions and goals from Paranoia a little bit. Be a great way to introduce them into your adventures because the dumbest way possible would be you're just traveling somewhere around the corner. There's a group of them. Everybody roll initiative. Okay, well you can do that, but what if the party stumbles over one of those caches you guys kind of invented on air last episode? And oh look, it's a whole <laughs> box, you know, a whole metal box full of goodies. And then and then you know a couple of them pop up and go, hey, hey, hey. that's ours. <laughs> All right. Well, Marvin, the intentions of the last question, well, what are the differences between the two subgroups of the curator's archaic alignment? What, what was the intention behind, behind the two groups? Uh, once a proper religious order that is never going to give an, up an artifact and wants all of yours, and the other group are a milk toast, mild version of the magic shop. Here's a mm -hmm. trader with, with just, you know, junk stuff and maybe somewhere in his whole little cart He's dragging along. There's a power cell, but he might come through your village. All right. Well, we've got a question specifically for you for this episode, and we've got quite a few. So we're going to dive right in. Uh, Milan, are you ready to go? I'm ready. This is DJ Foxy. Let's hit it. <laughs> what are the characteristics of a manimal? If you could bring up question one, Elena, what makes a manimal a manimal? You know, for somebody who's just cracking the book open. Oh, me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just uh, sentient mutated animals. Uh, generally speaking, very Jack Kirby, uh, Commandy Last Boy on Earth or Planet of the Apes. They, they're they about our size. They bipedal walkers. They have hands, paws, or claws that can manipulate tools and they think and can speak. Okay. And Elaine, if you could bring up handout 1A from the book on page 36. Uh, we know that manimals get 1d7 hit points at each level. They get 1d2 random physical mutations and one random mental mutation. 
They have a bite or a claw attack. That's part of uh, their natural offense. And But because of their animalistic appearance, manimals have a negative four to the AI recognition roles. Uh, Marvin, when you were creating Mutant Call Classics, how, how, how are you envisioning the interaction between the uh, AI recognition and the penalties or bonuses that some of the classes get? I mean, we... When we were playtesting it, the the prototypical encounter of this sort where it, the different genotypes start to matter is they're, you know, they encounter a very lush, well-tended area that's got an agricultural robot in charge of it. He's been trimming the edges and pruning the trees and growing the fruit for forever. And the party meets him. Okay, you know, if they make the roll, then he can t- he'll recognize the humans or, or not grossly mutated mutant humans. Um, as uh, people, and that unlocks the ability for them to have a discussion. Uh, when the roles go bad the other way, uh, for the manimals and plantings, he just sees you know, a pet that's loose that has to be captured and detained and possibly euthanized, or a tree that needs trimming. Yeah. Well, the poor, the poor plantians don't ever. It, it doesn't matter. You could roll a nat twenty as a plantient, and the robot, the AI, is not going to see you as anything but a shrubbery. We we're going to get to that, but you know that that garden bot may try to trim that uh plantain if it's too big. Uh, but if we can bring up that's handout, the idea, you know. If we could bring yeah. up handout one B, Elena. Uh, so another aspect of the manimals is that they have no natural affinity for the artifacts of the ancients, but they do gain some bonuses for use with experience over time. So as we were talking about it, as we've been diving into the and minutia of mutant crawl classics the i i've brought it up a few times that i think the pure strain humans should you know have the best chance to use artifact of the ancients do you find that even though they can grasp things but with like paws and big you know uh lion kind of uh, you know gripping paws they're gonna have a difficult time holding a, a laser rifle or a dazer rifle is is that am i thinking the right well, the intention was that uh, they've got, you know, an opposable digit and manipulative paws, and plantings would just have the plant version of that, tendrils, fronds, whatever, that, that work like our hands do. And as far as manipulating and using the stuff, just as well, okay. uh, because they're competing races in this world where every third thing thinks and talks. But where it does have an effect is if it's uh, a suit or a helmet. Or something that has to go on a human skull or a hand, a glove that has to fit on a human hand, then possibly as a judge, I would uh, rule that they're having issues. I, I think, you know, if you want to have issues related to a blast or, or using something like that, that is probably going to originate from a defect, not just being a manual. Well, I mean, you're a mutant human, and and you've got you know all the right body parts, and not giant horns growing out your head. Okay, you can put mm-hmm. that suit on, um, but if you've got wings, no, you can't. And uh, that stuff is not written in to the rules, uh, partly because uh, just taking uh, uh, a broader outstroke, and then you run with it. You know, you take the chances with your campaign, and that's because of the time I grew up in where. You know, it was it was uh, rulings, not rules. It puts it does put a, an onus and a level of responsibility on the judge that uh, maybe not everybody is comfortable with. They want to look up, okay, or but ideally that's role playing too. You know, if it's a player trying to persuade me of something, and and I and it's not written in the rules. Now we're just having a conversation, and I tell everybody I'm an old school judge. I'm I'm not uh, evil. Uh, but if you're committed to TPK, I'll allow it. And mm-hmm. if you, if you, you know, I'm not banging on anybody, but newer generations of players, like at a con game, will say, "Well, can I do though, though, that, that?" And I'm like, uh, "I don't know. Can you? It's your job to convince me. You tell me what you do, and if you completely convince me, it just happens. If if you don't completely convince me, but it's we think it's possible, we'll figure out a die roll and go with it. Which is uh, unfortunately the opposite of rules as written. Yeah. Well, there is right. one more aspect that I want to talk about real quick, uh, and that's if Lane, if you could bring up handout one C for us on page thirty six, it talks about them being either a part of the clan of the Cog, or they can be a chosen zoo, which we kind of asked from last one of the questions. But the part I want to talk about is page one forty four. It says so. There's a long standing oral tradition among the chosen zoo 
that they owe their very existence to an ancient one called Dr. Thaddeus Handyman, creator of the holy substance known as Cortexin. Uh, not to be confused with Corvaxian, uh, you know, shout out to Father Goose, and not to be confused with Covaxian, shout out to Doug Kovax. But what's the inspiration? Who is this Dr. Thaddeus Handyman? And would we know him in today's day and age? Is this Washington Zoo, the uh, Smithsonian Zoo that I'm thinking it might be? It's, uh, you know, uh, all uh, very, uh, there's sometimes it's a homage and sometimes you're just stealing. It's all stolen straight from Commandy number 13. If I got the issue number right, you know, Commandy and his crew of uh, tigers and Dr. Canis stumble into a war that's taking place in Washington, D.C. And the whole issue, it, Jack Kirby does a parallel. There's an ape hospital with Dr. Han Human experimenting on the then currently dumb humans with a substance that he's put together from notes from a different doctor, you know, hundreds of years ago or whenever the great disaster happened, that is the substance that leaked into the water in the great disaster war and made the animals smart. Nice. Now, one final question. Well, just, uh, it, maybe it's so maybe that's an Easter egg. I know. And, yeah. and the stuff is called Cortexin. I mean, you know, Jack Kirby, uh, a state could sue me for state, taking that, I guess. If a bear manimal or a tiger manimal or something similar to that shaved their head, and put on a nice business suit to give them a bonus to tricking some robots that they're humans. Oh, don't listen to that, Jim. I, uh, I, I mean, a, in a game than... session, a little one, yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Depending on how much yeah, effort you yeah, put plus into one. it, and, and like, like I said, you're you're already starting to convince me. You know, a plus mm -hmm. one or not a minus two, a minus one, sure. Yeah, it's the, it's the main on the inside that counts. They're, no, they're still no. an animal. It's it's slide rules things because how screwed up is that AI? You know, they go insane after a few thousand years. DJ Foxy would never shave his mane ever. It's sacred. <laughs> Uh, but let's get to our answers. What are the characteristics of a manual if you choose to play one in your first game of Mutant Crawl Classics? Well, you get a D7 hit points. You get 1D2 random physical mutations, maybe one uh, one mental mutation, random. Uh, you get a D4 biter claw. You can be part of the Clan of the Cog or the Chosen Zoo. Um, you don't get any help with uh, artifacts of the ancients in the beginning, and you're going to have a little negative four to be in, recognized by the AIs. But and your whole they, class power. power they, they do. We are going to get to that in our next questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, so that's secret. And you uh, get a healthy musk. Milan, what is our next question? Our next question, it is exactly about the pack mentality. Uh, so the first manimal using it, does that first manimal gain the cumulative bonus, or is it only the second manimal that attacks the same target? Now we are getting into rules as written here. And this I'll came up. At the, this came up at Game Ocon because this exact question actually happened at the table. Nice. Mm. Uh, I'm going to give us a little context. So, Elena, if you could bring up handout two A, it says on page 36: When coordinating melee attacks on the same target, manimals gain a plus one attack for each manimal attacking a single opponent within the same combat round. Now, I think the key word there is to coordinating. And I've never ran it this way, and I think I might have been running it incorrectly, but I would just give the manimals after the plus one. But Marvin, do they get, does that first manimal get the plus one bonus? The rules is written, but the requirement is before that combat round starts at highest initiative, the uh, manimal players have to tell me have to tell the judge, okay, we're all ganging up on that guy right there. And uh, the uh, if there's a lot of manimals, that can stock up. And then the uh, inevitable next question, I think, is probably coming. The, I what happens you, if? I think you are correct. Uh, hmm. Molan, is that how you see it? Uh, That's how, how I see how, it. Have, how have you been running? Well, when all my beastmen gang up on a bunch of villagers, I like to give them bonuses as well. That's... Maybe not rules is written over in sailors' land, but uh, yes, it, if if they all agree, for, you know, before the actions that that is what they're gonna stick to, I'll give it to them. Now I searched the internet for some pack mentality tactics uh, so we could get a little bit of reference. Uh, Elaine, if you could bring up handout two B, 
uh, you know, and we're talking about the, the greatest packs of all hunters of all time, wolf packs. When hunting, wolf pack members spread out across their territory. They howl back and forth to determine each other's location using long howls that slightly rise and fall in pitch. And if we had Wolf Manzella on, he could, you know, be a determination. He's just been on a couple shows. Uh, because of their low pitch and long duration, these howls can be heard up to several miles away. So there's got to be a communication there going on. Hey, I'm over here. I'm about to move into here. Hey, look, I found something. Hey, I'm about to kill this thing. Get on over here. Uh, so they're talking. And so I think the coordination factor has to happen for those mammals, even the first one, to get that plus bonus. Is that how you see it, Marvin? Uh uh, when I was riding MCC, my brother has two two acre farms right next to, door to each other with a field in between. And our problem in the, on that property were coyotes here in Ohio. And uh, they had a they they had their own pack attack strategy where all the dogs I didn't have any dogs, but my brother had some farm dogs, and they all have to be big enough to be able to take care of themselves against a coyote or two. But the coyotes are smart. What they do when they want to get a dog is they send one coyote out to tease and screw around with the dog, and then they run. And when the dog chases them, he finds himself suddenly in the brush surrounded by the entire pack that's waiting in ambush. So that's one way that real-life animals do it. I like to call that the uh, the Braveheart ruse. Send one of the peasants out there, get them to come into the ravine, and then you're surrounded by archers and and warriors. Oops. Blue paint. Uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, rules is written. I mean, does the first animal using the pack mentality ability gain the cumulative bonus for all the animals after them? Yes. Uh, I would say yes. By If they're coordinating and if they all agree to attack the same target. Uh, so me and Marvin have the same answer. Molan, what is your final oh, answer? Same answer. I'll give any beast man any bonus he wants. All right. Now... Marvin, you you alluded to the second question that was coming, and uh, you are a wise mage indeed because that is the question. When using the pack mentality ability, Elaine, if you could bring up question three, does a manimal lose their action if the target they're attacking dies? Uh, I I, I think you mean do they lose their bonus because they no, they... if they're declaring what they're going to attack. Would they lose their action? Because they're saying, I'm going to attack Milan. The Beastmen have revolted. I'm going to attack Milan. There's a couple wizards over there, but I'm going to attack him. So All right, let, me, let me get into the raw rules as written spirit here. Uh, rules as written are quiet on that. They do, they, they, they do not say. Uh, me personally, the way I run it uh, uh, in a campaign, absolutely, they can change to different targets. But rules is written, they would no longer get their pack bonus because they've switched targets. Um, at a con game, uh, just you know, we're just here for four hours. I I, I let it slide. They so, can cho they they choose another target and they maintain the bonus as long as the remaining players in that initiative order have all agreed on who's next. Right. Oh, but so rules if, rules is written. If the first guy or two kills that uh, targeted uh, target, then the bonus disappears because he's dead. That's what and I'm I and I wouldn't penalize them with you've committed to hitting this guy he's dead now you can't switch in the middle of combat cuz well what I'm thinking time. Marvin is I'm you know Molan's a chaos lord so he may agree with me here what I'm thinking is you know if I've got a pack of five other animals that I'm running around with and we're big bullies and we're like hey we're all going to gang up on this dude even though there's 10 dudes if we all commit to attacking the same guy and the first one of us if I'm the first one to hit and I get a plus 5 to my hit I'm already got that in the bank. I'm banking them. I'm banking their actions. So Milan, what do you think? If I've already received the benefit, doesn't the pain have to follow? Because they committed. You know, I they have said they commit. I think because it. Re I really hate it when I get hit with the paralysis spell and can't do a darn thing. I think I would maybe let them veer off. Say. You've used up half your movement speed, truck going where you thought you were going to go, and now you're changing direction so you can go up to another guy. Something like that. Because so, losing your round like that, ah, no fun. No fun. I hate it. 
So, so listen to where I'm coming from, Marvin. This is all in the same action, right? This is all happening simultaneously. What I'm enjoying about this, Matt, is usually when you get passionate like this, it's player advantage advocacy. But in this instance, I think you're taking the side of the judge. I, I kind of, I'm taking the, I always try to take the side of realism, even though it's a fantasy game. I have that fault. That's one of my main faults is I use my, you know, what's realistic. So if everybody, if these six pack animals commit to killing this guy, one, they're already going to get the bonus. So they've already banked their action for the benefit of the group. And so because it's all happening instantaneously and you've committed to an action, you know, so you bite him or stab him and he's already dead. He was dead when the first two guys attacked him. You really wouldn't know that. You'd still be biting and attacking and stabbing. So. Fair I enough. Mean, I, I'm not sure. Think, I'm not sure if I would well, let. Allow me to retort. Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, that's what. The, the what two most for. important things are verisimilitude, if I pronounce that right, and having fun. So however you rule at your table, it it has to stay that way forever so you're consistent. But on the having fun side, I, I get semi uncomfortable when you're arguing realism in a game where I can burn all the stats I have and do a flaming <laughs> hands that opens a magma vent to the Earth's core. I told you it was one of my faults. Um, but as, but if it was consistent, okay, like you know, I'm just you know, people do it all the time. That's how different games get invented. Okay, this is going to be realistic. You know, Robert E. Howard down and dirty. DCC or MCC, fine, go for it. Yeah, it's one of the things that I, you know, I, I try Judges to let gotta the have fun too, imagination right? flow. That is true. That is true. Uh, but so I can see the argument either way. Uh, rules is written. If we're addressing the question directly, when using the pack mentality, uh, I think I've got another handout here as, as some uh, corroborating evidence. Elaine, if you could bring up handout 3B. Um, and this is... A reckless character can use one action to declare a charge, page 139. In order to charge, they must move at least half the speed, and a charging character gains plus two to the attack and suffers a negative two penalty. So if they have to declare a charge the, before they actually charge, or let's say in the event of spell burn, you have to declare you're going to spell burn before you get to spell burn, get the bonus. Isn't that on the same level as declaring to get the pack mentality bonus? You can't take Spellburn back, and you can't take the charge back once you've committed to it. So why would this be any different? I'm sorry. As you were explaining that, I got very caught up in the idea of a table full of players smart enough to figure out how to stack them both. Okay, I, all them I, animals, get together. That I guy, everybody different. charge now. <laughs> and we're going to go in. We're going in with a plus 10. That's true. That would be I, ridiculous. I think it would be different. Spellburn, you are declaring that on your turn, your count in the initiative round. Same with charge. You're declaring it on your count in the initiative round. Well, plus Spellburn uh, is a simulation of I slit my wrist. I yanked out my fingernails and threw them into the spell. So you took a an action, not in the game rule sense, in front of casting. I, you As guys opposed still... to, you know, just John Belushi in it. Everybody got him! I guess, but that that coordination can be considered its own in-game action. I think I think what you're proposing is a fine way to run it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not in the rules. It is not I in think, the rules. I think what you're proposing is an additional rule. Yeah, so let's give our final answers here. Uh, we we got to go by the book. That's the name of the show. When using the pack mentality ability, does the manimal lose their action if the target they are attacking dies? Um, rules is written. It's not in the book. It doesn't say. It is left up to your table for you to decide. Molan, how do you see it? I see it much the same. We have all suggested solutions. Some worse, like yours, Matt. Some better, like mine. And some very, very adequate for a human, like Marvin over there. What do you say, Marvin? I say I'm glad I did this podcast without my glasses on because I smile <laughs> with my eyes. I, I think I, I just love the discussion. Thank you for having me on here for this. Uh, one of the characteristics of the show is we present good ideas, bad ideas, great ideas, and horrible ideas. And you make sense out of them all. You take what you want. I um, just do the best well, I can, but I've been well, watching these. We always these. do it with a great guest. 
I've been watching these and and uh, and all the guests have been great. And last week with Erica was just if I think it was last week. I've been to Game Hole. Yeah, was was thank you, thank you. Uh, she is amongst I, my I know now if I guys. sit as a player at her table, I better have my shit wired tight. Yeah. Uh, well, Milan, would you like to bring up our next question? Question four. Yes, we get a, even further away from humans, so I love it. What are the characteristics of a plantient? All right, Marvin. So we went over the uh, manimals pretty well. I think anybody who watches this will have a good handle on playing a manimal. But now let's talk about plantients. What distinction makes a plantient? I didn't want to even do that class because in Gamma World, I hated sure. the whole idea of uh, sentient plants as player characters. So sitting down to do uh, MCC, it's just, you know, you're, if you're writing a game, it's give the people what they want. So what I did with the plantients was make it entertaining for me. So a plantient, just in structure and principle, not entirely different than a manimal. It's a around our size, give or take a foot, bipedal plant that's intelligent, can speak, and has many tool, the ability to manipulate tools with some kind of digits. Um, however, and, and it, this is outside of rules as written, there's some implications to that that I adore playing, playing out in a game. Okay, you're, you're suddenly in a vacuum chamber in a ruin somewhere, but everybody's got their bubbled helmet on, so they slap it on for their 24-hour supply of oxygen. Well, that doesn't do the planting character any good whatsoever. He breathes CO2. Um, you're going across the glow desert. Well, the planting's got all the sunshine, and if he, he or she packed water, they're, they're, they're okay for a while, but they don't have any place to tap their roots. I, I adore playing that stuff out in, in uh, the game. And I actually just found that that sentence where, you know, uh, they would either dig their roots in or, you know, need sun and water and stuff like that. And that, doing this research, I just found that little paragraph and I wish it was in their book more. So, uh, you know, people could just gain that wealth of information, that atmosphere about it. And I was like, what is this? I hadn't even seen it. But Elena, if you could bring a handout for a let's talk about, uh, you know, a little of the nuts and bolts of the planting in class. They gain a D5 uh, hit points each level. They get 1D3 random physical mutations, no mental mutations. Uh, Marvin, why is it there? We found an exception to the rule. There's one mutation where they can get a mental mutation, but why defect. can't, uh, what was it, Mulan? I believe it was a defect, a special defect. If you roll high on it, you, you can get a mental mutation. So, so there is one play. exception in the book, but... Why can't plantians get mental mutations? Uh, design philosophy wise, because the, although they uh, are intelligent, their neural structure would be of a completely alien cell structure. Um, I was just thinking of like the Alan Moore era of Swamp Thing, you know, which was, uh, you know, genius writing for, you know, the whole Peak lifetime of that character. We thought it was Alec Hall and who the formula changed him into Swamp Thing. And then he, in the Alan Moore issues, he discovers, no, through some RNA process, his intelligence went into a completely plant character. So, you know, the, like the difference between uh, vertebrates and cephalopods, uh, octopi octopuses and cuttlefish have like distributed neural networks. Their, their brains go all the way down each arm. So that was my thinking with the no nice. mental mutations. Plus it's game balance. They're the weakest hit points because they're the luckiest class. I love it. Uh, so one of the other aspects is they also gain a D4 thorn or spine missile attack. Um, but the uh, one of the bad things, or maybe a good thing, as we've spoken on before, is they are not recognized by AIs at all. Um, so Marvin, having plantients not be recognized by AI, that's played out several hysterical ways for me in games um how did you imagine that playing out when it was written that way well i, I think i already talked about it but uh i mean you know if you're a smart bunch of players and you know you've got a good we're smart and we're murder hobo mentality nothing is forever like in in a game session if the party comes to me and goes okay the plantient has you know has managed to fit themselves inside some kind of suit and and we've crafted paints and dyes this human face on it you know 
like some in ridiculous Rick and Morty way, they could possibly have a shot. Never say right. never, right? Never, well, never, the, never deny the player actually agent. have the ultimate advantage and that they can just slowly move across and just kind of look like a potted plant. What happens? When that's an has, excellent point. You know, it goes both ways. If they don't everybody recognize always you, you're, sends you're, the you're never a threat. First. Yeah. Everybody always sends the planty in at first when the laser beam guns are, you know, uh, turreting. Uh, would the laser beam guns ever shoot the planty in? It would depend on what the AI was programmed to do. But in general, why would you ever, why would an AI ever be programmed to knock out the trees and shrubs? Because they're Tear moving. Up the flower bed. Because they're walking across the ground. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I see your point. Elaine, if you could bring up handout 4B for us, we're going to talk about uh, Plantius. They have a general antipathy for artifacts of the ancients, gaining minor bonuses at higher levels. And if you can follow that up with handout 4C, now going through my research, Plantients at level one are the only class that has, actually has a negative to start out with. They have a negative one to their artifact check. What was the uh, thinking thought process behind that? They would just be the furthest removed genotype uh, for which the artifacts have all been designed. Right? Nice. As, yeah. I mean, as I suspected. Or, or mm -hmm. in some cases, you know, the, the sonic hedge termers were designed to get them. <laughs> now, what if uh, there was a class of chaos norms? How would they also have a negative one? Or Molan would. Would they have a plus 10 bonus? Plus 10s to everything. Mm. Plus 10s. <laughs> well, Elaine, if you could bring up our last handout for this question. Handout 4D, uh, page 38. We're talking about the uh, archaic alignments again. They can either start as a clan of the cog or autom atomic equinox alignments. Uh, and then page 146 has a little bit more of the atomic equinox they are members of the genotypes to join as special warders to assist them in their primary task of taking care of the natural environment. Now, I don't want to dive too much into this because we're going to talk about it more next episode. Uh, we're going to talk about the archaic alignments that we haven't dove into yet. Uh, the Vile Brotherhood, uh, the Atomic Those guys Equinox. are great. Uh, but this yeah, is I bet you like those guys. Yeah. The, the the atomic equinox they're basically taking care of every kind of plant life out there on terra ad is that accurate Marvin? right and 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 there's another really good class for player character plantings to join because they're not even militant about it they just want to you know preserve this forest preserve this glen and if you're a different genotype that wants to help them that you know it's very equanimous sure join join this alignment and help us out all right. Well, Just don't, you know, don't get caught burning down trees later. I, I think we don't even need to lock in those answers. Those are straight out of the book. Um, Bolan, do you want to bring up question five for our guest? Absolutely. So the plantings need to have line of sight with the recipient of their good luck. That's something that's actually mm -hmm. written into DCC for halflings. They have to have line of sight, which rules out any daredevil style halfling. To, now, to my, you know, to, to everyone's loss. So the, when I was researching this, I, I've stumbled upon the explanation. Uh, not stumbled upon it. I've read it 20 times, but I never really absorbed it, which is, uh, you know, happens a lot until I do these shows. But Marvin, do they have to have line of sight with the target? I've always ruled it that way. I, I apologize that it, it wasn't specifically written out in the rules because that just makes common sense. Um, but, you know, it could also be flexible at the beginning of combat round. You know, I charge you up. I'm a plant that charges you up with luck. And then you run around the corner where you still got the luck to the end of that combat round. So what I'm thinking on this one is, Lena, if you could bring up handout 5B for us first. We'll talk about the halfling luck real quick. Uh, page 60 and 61 of the DCC RPG. It specifically states the halfling can rub off on those around him. They can expend luck to their allies. They have to be nearby and visible to the halfling. So that's the criteria we have for the halfling giving luck. Now, the plantient class on page 38, Elaine, if you could bring up handout 5A, says, very interesting here, plantients naturally excrete fragrances, pollens, and spores that cause most creatures to treat them favorably, even if subconsciously. The plantian characters are naturally lucky and gain two points of luck for every one point spent, and they may donate this luck to others if they so choose. 
And then, of course, it goes on to talk about the regeneration. But I'm thinking they're always excreting these pollens and fragrances. And the, the first movie that comes to mind is the one with Marky Mark, where the plants are going crazy. The world's trying to correct itself. And, uh, you know, the, the earth is trying to kill off the human race. And you can tell by the way the plants are blowing and stuff like that. Molan, what are you thinking? What movie is that? I, I'm going to look it up right here. The Happening. The it's Happening. not worth watching. I've not seen that. i got to go watch you, that stuff. You take that back. Marky you Mark is a to. national treasure. Marky Mark is a national treasure, Milan. You must even like his rap group then. Of course not. But, you know, the the what was the Storm movie? The Greatest Storm or something? The Perfect Storm. The Perfect Storm. Marky Mark is a national treasure. We're off gonna... subject. If it's a good movie, I'm not going to hold Marky Mark against it because a boy and his dog has got, you know, teenage Don Johnson in it, and it's a fantastic movie. So the movie is The Happening, and the Earth is trying to correct itself, and I don't even remember. It's been so long, but you can tell by the waves and the wind and the tree, and these pheromones and, and pollens are being distributed from the plants through the wind. And so that's how I'm thinking the plantians are distributing their luck. Like if Molan's two buildings away and I just shake my leaves, I as can long as Mulan. I can, yeah, as long as I can smell those flower parts, I'm getting lucky. That's what I'm thinking, Marvin. What do you think about that? You know, idea. I think that's not rules as written. Although, <laughs> uh, uh, I, 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 I apologize. Had I been thinking or writing better, I would have put the same halfling rule in because plantians were game design wise meant to mirror the function of halflings that's that's why there's the same seven classes in mcc as in dcc although they're different archetypally it's this it's it's relatively the same mm -hmm. so well, i i would i would require line of sight but uh you know i have again you're advocating for something that is uh okay our group this session the planning character, you know, okay, so and so's got, you know, his fusion fan. I'm gonna have him position him right behind me, stretch all my branches out in this direction and try and blow my luck around the corner for the guy. We could we could work our way through that in a game. I have one more piece of evidence. Elena, if you could bring up handout five C for my argument on page one sixteen under the mental mega mutation called meditative state. The uh, a just very humble result of 20 or 21, the plantian is able to temporarily increase the potency of its fragrance pheromones. And for the plantian's level in rounds, they can hinder the rolls of an adversary by negative one point for every point of luck spent. So one for one, you could bring the judge's score down. Now, first off, this this mega mutation, which yay, right? Yes, this is the mm -hmm. first one that I've ever seen affect the judge's role. Usually, that's taboo. So I I, I was thrilled when I read it that we could actually affect the uh, the judge's role. Of course, I never get mega mutations, but I think subconsciously, Marvin, when you were writing this. The temporary increase in the potency of its fragrance pheromones kind of supports my argument that as long as they can smell it, the luck is being in the air. It's breathable. I I love it, man. Listen, I you know, I didn't just write MCC on a lark or and my abiding love of DCC just didn't happen for not reasons. I mean, I I, I love everything uh, Joe did with that game. And the OP stuff at like at the end of spell tables or, uh, you know, a halfling's dual wielding and gets two crits or the mighty D died, all that stuff written in there. It gives the, it gives a traditional RPG, a little of that magic, the gathering flavor, or from my day, uh, the board game cosmic encounters where it's very basic core rules onto which each character or alien or race or genotype or whatever gets their thing that can run to an OP extreme. And then when it happens two or three times in the same combat round, now you've got this going on and you've got to figure out, okay, what happened first? And then this happened and then this happened. I love that stuff in a game. All right. Well, let's give our final answers here. Rules is written. 
Do plantians need to have line of sight with the recipient of their good luck bonus? Milan, I'm going to let you start first. I don't think they have. They need to have line of sight, but they should be able to get to a position where they could have line of sight in the same round. So hmm. now yeah. my answer is going to be controversial, and it will go against what the creator says. But by omission of it not being in the book. I believe that raw rules as written is the pheromones of luck are in the air and they can be recipients as long as they have a, a working nostril. So if they get critted and can't breathe, they smell it, then they might not <laughs> have an effect. Uh, but as long as they are able to smell the scent of the luck, they do not need to have line of sight. Uh, that may be conversal to what the creator says, of course. Uh, and his opinion should always be taken over mine. Yeah. But that Mar is what I Marvin mean. the Mage as a character is definitely chaotic neutral. So Molan and I have more in common than may maybe you and I have. And I think together we've just been a corruptive influence on you because I'm hearing you advocate a position that's not in the rules as written. So Molan, you know, fist bump. All right. So we, Marvin, we, we, we brought him across the line on the alignment chart, I think. What is your final action? Do the Plantians need to have line of sight with the recipient of their good luck? I've always run it that way, but in practicality, it almost never comes up. Okay. There you have it. And Milan, do you want to hit him with the uh, last question for this evening? Absolutely. Are Plantians allowed an action when they are using the can't see the forest or the trees ability? Mm. So this is the one where they have to remain still. And as long as they pass that starting at 50% or under or over, whichever you pick, high or low. Uh, as you get up higher, 65, 70, et cetera, you roll under it. Can they get an action when they're doing that, Mark? Oh, me first. Yeah. Um, I, I I misunderstood the question at first. I thought, could they, could they, uh, is, is using that power in action in a round, which obviously it would be. Um, no, I mean, it says completely still. So, uh, You'd be into some kind of esoteric, I'm holding completely still. It doesn't say be silent, but if you're still, you're going to be silent. So they don't have mental mutations. If they had a mutation that they could fire off and remain completely still that didn't have a visible component, I might go the other way. But in general, no. It, it's right. just it, it's no different than an invisibility spell, spell in old D&D. &D. If you attack, it's it's dispelled. Uh, and that's a good point. I should have brought up a handout for that. Uh, but, you know, to back up this conversation, train of thought, on page 38, Elena, if you could bring up handout 6A, in most outdoor settings, plantient characters have only to remain still to gain an automatic 50% chance of hiding successfully. The chance of successfully hiding goes up by 5% for each level gained. Now, I've had it happen in play where the plantients when they're not taking an action, they just blanket say, I'm standing still for the rest of the game. Uh, is that an innate ability? Uh, if they're not moving, do they automatically not get detected or do they have to actively? Oh, this is like the Rover stealth thing all over again. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that episode too. Uh, but this is for the plantians though. It's, it's an ability, uh, you know, they are a plant. You know, that's a judge style question more than anything else, because we've all had the player that, you know, doesn't want to be bothered to announce each round he's standing still. So he writes you a note and says, from now on, whenever <laughs> I'm not talking or taking an action, I'm standing perfectly still to try and uh, game the rules a little bit. And how you handle that as an individual judge is totally up to you. I, 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 I me personally, I would just okie doke and go along with it and then look for my first opportunity to uh, uh, show him the consequences of what he wrote me. What would be those consequences? Uh, for instance, uh, uh, a combat breaks out and his own party doesn't see him either. So they start firing shots in his direction. That's a good point. Uh, Molan, how do you see it? I don't think they can do anything. If they want to say they're always standing still, I'm going to require them, I would require that they do something simple like keep their hand raised all the time they're standing still as a sign that they are actively mm. remembering to do that. Okay. Uh, that is a good point. Make them physically do something at the table. Let's bring up some other evidence from DCC RPG. And Lane, if you could bring up handout 6B for us. Um, 
On a successful hide and shadows check means the thief cannot be seen. As with sneaking silently, this check is never opposed and is often used before a backstab attempt. The thief can attempt to hide in broad daylight should they be so bold. Uh, it would be much easier for the planting to hide in broad daylight. But is this ever an opposed check, Marlin, Marvin? This uh, this hide in plain sight, you know, can't see the forest for the trees. Is there ever a detection from an agrobot to see if they're... Uh, can see uh, this oversized hedge that they need to trim? I mean, rules is written, and in general, no. However, this uh, as, as a judge, uh, I personally roll my dice in front of the screen because I find that aids the drama. This is one of those roles that the player doesn't roll. The judge has to roll it, and it doesn't do you any good if you don't roll it behind the screen. So, you know, you can give them, a, you feel like you blended right in, um, you're not sure kind of indicator of their success, but they they try it. And you roll to see what it what it does. That's but, a it, good point. But uh, in 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 general, sure. If you're if you're hidden, you're hidden from everything. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think of what the exceptions would be. Uh, maybe a, a patron level creature of some kind. Uh, that's a good point, Milan. Do you the high or a very specific situation trees. where it's it's an AI that's been programmed to scan for intelligent plants, which would never happen, but that might. Yeah, I, I think only a, with very specific AI programming or monster powers would would there be an opposed role situation. Almost all the time, it's just going to be that percentile check. And so for those roles, though, can't see the forest through the trees. Do you roll that, Milan, or do you have the players roll that? Yeah, either way. Um, if 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 I I tend to not roll behind the screen, so it doesn't matter. All right. Uh, so if they are completely frozen, so uh, the the handout the description says they have to remain still, and then they gain an automatic fifty percent chance of hiding successfully. Um, if they are, our original question was if they're remaining completely still and invisible then they get no action. That's kind of our original question. Their action is to stay there and be still. Milan, mm -hmm. is that how you see it as well? Absolutely. You just have to have, if you want to move along and remain unseen, your timing has to be perfect, but you can't do anything while you're still. Yeah. I mean, it, does... it, it's a good power because there are tactical situations where it's great to just vanish off the field of play. And so there has to be a price to pay, which is okay. Now you can't do anything else. And so as far as the location, Marvin, would you add any extra bonus or penalty? Do they have to be in the jungle setting, first of all? Like if they're inside, yeah, they could be a potted plant. But if they're in the glow desert where there's not one plant in sight, would you allow that ability at all or would it be reduced? Uh, or would it be the same? In, in, in practice, I, I limit the ability when they're like in an installation with no plants, although some installations have been opened up to plants, you know, vines and stuff growing. So, yeah, I do I do adjudicate it for the terrain and Glow Desert would be an excellent example of uh, you don't think that ability, you don't think you can do that out here. And sorry. OK, Milan, would you allow that building uh, on, so on top of your ziggurat? Would you? I mean, do you have plants <laughs> on top of your ziggurat? Would you allow that ability at all? All the plants on my ziggurat are poisonous, uh, but I would allow it. I would steal a mechanic and assign a penalty die. They can roll that percentile, but mm. they roll the, the tens column twice and take the worst result. All right. I like it. What uh, a good answer. Well, there you yeah, I think we've given our official answers on that one. Uh so, yeah, I would say no action as well. So this has been our amazing Halloween episode. Uh, I am DJ Foxy. Marvin, do you have anything coming up that you can share with us? Any secrets? Halloween secrets? Uh, certainly. Uh, if everything goes well, you know, rings crossed. Uh, next week, uh, the Kickstarter for Scientific Barbarian issue number six will be out. And uh, I start to say, I don't know if I'm allowed to say I'm the publisher. I, I, I allow myself to say that it will also feature an article on, of all things, Plantians by uh, a fellow host of this podcast. Nice. Uh, one and, of those uh, other guys. And some really good stuff. I try to make every issue better. 
better than the last one. This one has got a, a fantastic uh, article on science and sorcery are actually the same thing by James Michael Spahn. Fantastic piece. It's too good for my magazine. Everything I'm about to say is too good for my little rag. Um, the, the best fiction piece we've ever published uh, about some uh, generational starship being piloted by crew who've had their minds stuck in android bodies called We Stole It From Shakespeare. When I waked, I <laughs> cried to dream again. And uh, the whole theme of the issue is the Thundar the Barbarian uh, style of play like you would find in Reed uh, Filippo's America and Crawling on a Broken Moon. And there's a giant how to play Thundar in your favorite RPG article by Mark Hunt. And just on that alone, it's it's killer. Thank you for that amazing preview. And you guys heard it here on Raw First where we often have the exclusive secret information. Now, speaking of Reed Sanfilippo, I believe there was just an auction for Reed. Wasn't there, Milan? There was. I snapped up a whole bunch of art pieces and their publishing I, rights. I, I, I didn't even hear about the auction, or I would have fought you on some of those, but I saw you greedily scoop all that art, art up. Uh, I got a uh, lot. I, was I, very I, wish, I, would have, I wish I would have notified, known about that. Milan, do you, you have anything coming up? Uh, the... Kickstarter, Prisoners of the Secret Overlords, is in its final 48 hours. Some su juicy science fantasy adventure. Go back it. If you don't, I'll eat this cat. Don't oh, eat the no. cat. Please. Don't... Please, please. Please back, go. Back this project or the cat gets it. Let's all go back the project. Marvin, do you have your kitten anywhere nearby that uh, we might be able to get a um, peek? No, I'm sorry. She's being very excellent for once. She's just asleep under the desk. Oh, all right. Uh, Marvin, you were about to say something else. Uh... Oh, I was just going to mention, uh, if you want to support uh, Reed, because he's he, he, he needs it uh, for some uh, medical expenses, uh, there's also a GoFundMe that's very easy to track down. Just go to Facebook and uh, put in Reed Filippo, and you'll you'll stumble across it. Uh, in other big news, uh, I, DJ Foxy, will be at LongCon in uh, two weekends, uh, so about a week and a half in Longview, Texas, uh, playing some games with Eddie and Matt. Uh, Milan, are you going to be there? I'm going to be there. So many converts. All right. Uh, so we've still got uh, some DCC and MCC games we're going to run, so look for that. We'll have a booth set up. Um, let's see. What else do I got going on? There's, oh, the uh, OAR eight. Uh, oh just, yes, cousin Grim just started. Oh, Grim Tooth, dude, that I, went I, live this afternoon. I was watching the uh, video they have for that, and that looks awesome. Yeah, so okay. I am. I super had been, excited. I had been unaware that there is also a DCC adventure that you can get along with it. DCC one hundred six. So don't just think it's all traps. There's adventure yes. too. That adventure and uh, that looks awesome, and it's an adventure completely uh, focused around traps. So, if you haven't checked that out on Backer Kit yet, uh, go check that out. Um, otherwise, Marvin, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's Thanks always for having a pleasure me, guys. to have you on the show. We love it. Thank you for this creation that you've given to us to uh, even allow us to talk about. You're too uh, kind, Elena. Thank you for being an awesome Twitch mistress. Uh, everyone, happy Halloween! Oh. Molan, do you have a little little Molan child that you're taking out trick or treating? Oh yes, he is what a, a astronaut wizard this year, a astronaut space wizard. Oh, wizard. There you go. Nice, very nice. Well, I hope to see a picture of that costume later on. And are you going to be going out in your full regalia, or are you going to cover your eyeball? For I'm going to cover the eyeball. It scares the little children, yes, and yes. I need to be undercover. <laughs> All right. Well, this is DJ Foxy signing out. Uh, everybody have a happy Halloween, and we'll see you in two weeks.